by little until it finally acquires its final form, then you are guaranteeing the mind independence of that entity, while at the same time not introducing transcendental entities like essences into the, into the subject. I'm going to talk about that in a lot more detail. Right now I'm just summarizing what we're going to do. So from now to one o'clock, we're going to get rid of essences. Where I'm going to show you, I'm going to forget about everything else except the material world, mountains, birds, plants, clouds, and so on, and show you the kinds of scientific thinking that Toulouse has borrowed from science, in a very original way, by the way, as you will see. He doesn't follow scientists in a sheepish kind of way. He takes things from science and then weaves them into a, something that goes beyond science, something that is properly philosophical. But nevertheless, scientists have had a monopoly on the material world for at least 200, 300, 400 years, and so they have a lot of the material that we need. So today we're just simply going to trust scientists. We're going to trust mathematicians, we're going to trust physicists, we're going to trust biologists. We're going to get back to the question of what is science as a social entity later on, and at that point we'll raise all the doubts that can very validly be raised about the objectivity of science. Because that science is a very social enterprise and it's, it's, it's subjected to all the kinds of social pressures that any other kind of institution is. Scientists want legitimacy, scientists want prestige, scientists want money, scientists need all kinds of other social backup uh, 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 practices in order to do what they, whatever they do, and in the process, they introduce biases, they introduce false beliefs, and so on, into their own theories. But we'll get back to that. Today we're simply going to take for granted that scientists are collectively a very good community to produce knowledge about the material world, about physics and chemistry and biology, which is all that we're going to be talking about this morning, and then show how Deleuze has been able to get all the juicy stuff out of scientists and weave it, weave it together into something that is not science anymore, something that is philosophy. So we're going to dedicate the morning to getting rid of essences. And we get rid of essences by introducing processes. Processes of production. The process of production that produces materiological entities, the process of production that produces geological entities, the process of production that, pr that produces biological entities. After we finish that, at 1 o'clock we've got a lunch. We come back and then we'll switch gears completely to the other question that we've left out this morning, human experience. Well, if we are going to be claiming that all these things are independent of human experience, we might as well define right at the outset what are the theories of human experience. So tonight, or in the class from 1 to 4, I mean from 4 to 7, I'm sorry, we're going to switch gears completely, forget about everything that we said in the morning, and deal exclusively with human experience. So at that point, I'm going to contrast two, the two main sources, the two main roots of all our theories of human experience. Kant and Hume. One a German, the other one a British philosopher. Both were contemporaries, both admired each other's work, so at the time, there was not that sharp contrast that I'm going to try to draw today, but as those two traditions became, as those two sets of ideas, or those two philosophies became traditions, the two traditions did diverge enormously, and today, 200 years after the fact, there is very little in common with, between the followers of Kant on one hand and the followers of Hume on the other hand. Nevertheless, and the battle still goes on, you know, even even in, 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 in disciplines like artificial intelligence, you know, robotics, that you would never think has anything to do with biology, the two main schools of artificial intelligence, as we will see tonight, are actually divided along Kantian lines and along Humean lines. That just goes to show you the weight that these two guys have had, I mean, the, the influence that they have had on everything that followed after them. They are, in, they are even, even influencing robotic technology. 
the, the kind of technological style that you use to try to implement intelligence in machines is influenced by whether you're a follower of Hume or whether you're a follower of Kant. Now, most philosophers in the 20th century, as I said, Derrida, Foucault, Lyotard, Baudrillard, Lacan, not to mention all the phenomenologists, were Kantian. They would tell you that themselves. The only Humean in the continental philosophy tradition was Deleuze. Deleuze wrote his very first book about Hume. The book is called Subjectivity and Empiricism. Uh, and so from the outset, from a, from a book published in the 1950s, he was already declaring war, or at least he was declaring his position. I'm not siding with the majority here. The majority is, is, is Kantian. I'm siding with Hume because Hume has the most potential to develop a new theory of subjectivity. So tonight, then, from 4 to 7, we're going to spend the entire three-hour period studying Deleuze's take on Hume. I'm going to add some of my own examples from artificial intelligence and so on, just to, just to make you understand that this is influencing the way in which technology itself is being developed, but also the overall and, 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 and larger philosophical consequences of adopting one or the other. Towards the end of that class, I'm going to make the argument again that if you are a materialist, if you're convinced, if you in any way want to guarantee the rights of the material world, if you want the material world not to be reduced to subjectivity, not to be reduced to, if you, if you don't want this spectacle that we're seeing out, out the window to be reduced to humanity, which is a very provincial way of doing things, everything reduced to humanity, all, all the otherness of those mountains, all the otherness of, of many other landscapes in the planet reduced to the familiar stuff that we are already human, you have to side with Hume. I'm going to try to make that argument tonight. I'm not making the argument right now at all. But the, the two things go together. You cannot really be a materialist and then be a Kantian. Or rather, it's going to take you a lot more work to reconcile the two positions. But again, I'm not making an argument right now. I'm going to give you the argument as we move along. Tomorrow, we then... Since today we already covered the material world and the, the objective world and the subjective world, we need to start getting involved a little bit with the social world. And that's what we're going to be doing tomorrow. Tomorrow will be entirely dedicated to questions that have to do with sociality, with questions that have to do with society. In the morning, from one to from, from ten to one, I'm going to introduce the losers theory of assemblages. A very interesting theory, and it's, it's a theory that is directly aimed at Hegel. So if today he confronts Kant and Aristotle, Aristotle he will confront it in the morning, uh, 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 Kant he will confront it in the afternoon, tomorrow morning Deleuze confronts Hegel. Hegel of course is a theorist of totalities, of organic totalities, of wholes, that are irreducible to their parts. And that is what made Hegel very attractive to Marx. Marx, of course, Marx materialism is based on Hegelian dialectics. Because there is a synthesis, there's a synthesis of the whole through what is called the, through the, through the uh, negation of the negation, to the confrontation of a thesis and its antithesis. There's a synthesis. And Marx knew that if you are going to have a, a, a materialism, you need a process of synthesis. We agree with Marx because, as I said before, today we're going to demonstrate that we don't need essences, we only need to process the synthesized things. The synthesized clouds, the synthesized mountains, the synthesized plants and animals. Nevertheless, we cannot base those synthesis on something that somebody at the beginning of the 19th century said. The negation of the negation. The Hegelian synthesis. We today have access to a, a, an entire a much wider repertoire of ways of thinking about synthesis that don't have to go all the way back to Hegel. But most importantly, Hegel conceived of wholes that are more than the sum of their parts as indecomposable. He used the human body many times.